ओके सो वेलकम टू लेक्चर नंबर 18 ऑफ दिस कोर्स सो वी डिड 17 बिफोर मिड सेम एंड वी विल डू अबाउट 17 आल्सो आफ्टर एंड इन दिस हाफ ऑफ द कोर्स वी आर गोइंग टू फाइनली मेक यूज ऑफ एवरीथिंग दैट वी हैव डेवलप्ड सो द होल फर्स्ट हाफ वेंट इन डेवलपिंग अ फ्यू डिफरेंट फॉर्मलिजम्स सो लेट मी जस्ट रिमाइंड यू वन वाज सिमेट्रीज <clears throat> another was gauge invariance another was fermions which has its own formalism including anti commuting numbers another one which might fit under gauge invariance but it's a separate and more complicated thing is yang mills theory and then apart from all this there was path integral and then there was path integral for anti commuting numbers ordinary and path integral for anti commuting numbers and there was also imaginary time formalism and related to it the partition function so strictly none of this is directly something that you will test in an experiment or try to create in a lab or something these are all part of the formalism underlying qft and although you might have studied some of these in qft1 particularly some aspects of gauge invariance uh, and some aspects of fermions uh, i hope that we did a more thorough job of those things and also of all the other things over here so it's a quite a heavy bunch of stuff and that's somehow unfortunately what qft is it's a very um, solid and difficult bunch of formal uh, equations and procedures and calculational procedures but is justified by the fact that eventually it allows us to do calculations which describe nature not just well but extremely well so there's nothing in this list that is not needed so to say all of these have important application in describing nature in fact those of you who are doing uh, advanced particle physics are probably aware that almost everything in this appears in the standard model of particle physics uh, <clears throat> so that's for you to connect i do want to emphasize that uh, one thing you may not have been uh, advised when you in previous years but in the fourth year you should do it is you need to connect the material from different courses like when you hear me say something you say ah arun said this thing in his class and that is exactly what is being described here under some other name and so you should try to make those interconnections because ultimately these are all related so today we'll take a first step towards extracting physics from the path integral it's still a baby step because the physics we extract will be something that you have already done in qft1 namely perturbative qft but once we get the preliminaries out of the way you will be pleasantly surprised how natural and relatively simple perturbative qft is when it's done in this way there are no arbitrary rules all the rules arise from a very definite precise calculation and you will also be i hope happy that all the problems we faced in defining path integrals and their measures will sort of go away okay so these are two things you should look forward to so what is the thing we want to study and the thing we want to study is a scattering amplitude
and so we like to start by formulating formulating this now note that our path integral formalism was not actually set up uh, to study specifically scattering amplitudes it was set up first of all in quantum mechanics to take you from a position eigenstate at one time to a position eigenstate at another time but certainly no accelerator actually does anything like that so we have to somehow map what we know onto the things that we can uh, that correctly model what an accelerator or an experiment does so the starting point again little bit of formalism here uh, the starting point is not something we measure but it's very important is the vacuum the actual uh, actual vacuum of the qft now this is a state that's not known exactly in almost any qft it can be a boring state or it can be a very interesting state for example in strong interactions quantum chromodynamics the vacuum is supposed to be a very interesting state full of quarks bubble quarks and gluons bubbling and doing all kind of things and one doesn't really know how to construct these things because they are way 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 too complicated we can try to construct the actual vacuum in a free theory but that's the free vacuum that one we are very used to that's called the fock vacuum Mm, that's the one where all the oscillators which lower the state or destroy particles they just annihilate the vacuum so in the free theory uh, <coughs> we'll use a different name in the free theory we'll call the vacuum zero and define it by ak on zero is zero for all k and then we are sort of done and it is boring and it's basically empty but the full vacuum is nothing of the sort okay so nevertheless let's try to phrase a question uh, relating to that full vacuum and let's first say why we want that vacuum it's because when we um, uh, carry out a scattering experiment uh, a particle a couple of particles let's say come in from far away relative to the interaction region and when they are far away we like to sort of pretend or believe that it is like just those particles and nothing else okay and that nothing else is what we mean by the vacuum so we have a particle state or a two particle state in the far past built over the actual vacuum of the theory so we start by studying this vacuum and then slowly we'll start by making some states on it so that's why and in the far future again we have a vacuum and that's called the so the in the vacuum in the far past is called omega in the vacuum in the far future uh, oh my notation is to write it like this omega in and the vacuum in the far future we'll call omega out and the question we want to ask right now is what is the overlap between these states okay you can associate a time uh, with this and a time with this such that the difference between those times is t there's nothing to propagate in between we just want to know what is the overlap of the Uh, past vacuum with the future vacuum why do we want that because later we'll have some particles in between then the question would become what happens if i take the past vacuum and create some particles and then project it onto the future vacuum so that is somehow the model of what an experiment is hmm? so we start with this simpler question and in particular the question is can we write this in path integrals at the path integral the answer is yes and we'll do it now and once we've done it we'll start building on that so everything will be built on this first calculation now the key idea here is to remember what do we know about path integrals for quantum mechanics we know how to write the path integral starting with a position eigen state and ending with a position eigen state in field theory also as we did in the last few lectures we know how to start with a field eigen state and end with a field eigen state hmm? but that's not what these states are so we need to connect these somehow to field eigen states and that's what we'll try to do 
So the trick is the following. Uh, we'll start with a field eigenstate phi i. This i is for initial at minus t by 2. So often in this course, I have taken the starting time to be 0 and ending time to be t. But actually, it's more symmetrical to take minus t by 2 and plus t by 2. Okay. Yes. Why is it not field eigenstate? Phi can act on it. Uh, Sorry? Phi can act on this omega. Yes. So that doesn't make a field eigenstate. Uh, phi can act on omega, but it will give some other state, it's right? It's a state of Hilbert space. Yeah. Uh, omega is a state such that if phi acts on it, the new state is phi acting on it. It's not equal to itself. But a field eigenstate is a state that when phi acts on it, I get back the same state with an eigenvalue, which is some function of the, which is the field. Uh, which is the field itself. So that's a different thing and that's what if you look at your notes that's what we actually showed how to write as a path integral by copying the uh, thing we did for quantum mechanics. Simply if we copy that to field theory we get the path integral but evaluated between field eigenstates. Hmm? And what we did if you remember is we had field eigenstate then we had e to the minus h times t and field eigenstate and that's what we know how to calculate. But this isn't a field eigenstate and this is what I want to relate to a field eigenstate. And the way I'm, this is a field eigenstate and what I'm going to do is to multiply this by e to the minus i h t by 2. The 2 doesn't matter so much, but as you can see by doing this, I'm propagating it to the time 0, halfway, half of my time interval. So this state which is a field eigenstate propagated till time 0. Now I am going to take a limit of it, which is going to make it proportional to omega e. <coughs> and that limit is very important. And it's a slightly clever limit. So I am going to take the limit where t goes to infinity, but not just infinity, but infinity times 1 minus i epsilon. Now, of course, there is no number called infinity. So you have to imagine that t goes to some large positive real number multiplied by 1 minus i epsilon. Why did I do this? Because it, uh, the extra piece minus i epsilon when I put it here will give me something which is going to project this state onto this state. So let's do it. Hmm? It's rigged up to just do that. So let's actually try to evaluate this limit. This is equal to, first I'll use the fact that um, I can insert a complete set of energy eigenstates. So this is limit, same limit. E to the minus i h t by 2 n n. So again, I assume that uh, there's a set of energy eigenstates. So I'll just put a summation over n. I won't be very careful whether there's a continuous or discrete set, but I'll just symbolically sum over that. So that's just one. And then uh, on the right of that, I have my original state phi i at minus 2 by 2. Now that I've inserted energy eigenstates, I can evaluate h on n, and it gives me the nth energy eigenvalue E n. So this is still summation over n limit t goes to infinity 1 minus i epsilon that I'll take last e to the minus e n t over 2. Okay, then n n. Uh, but now, uh, uh, yeah, n n, same thing. And now I can see what this limit is going to do for me. So what's going to happen, this quantity is going to be e to the minus i e n by 2, some large number. I'll just call it infinity. I hope you won't mind my informal notation. I could always have said t goes to some real number n times 1 minus infinity. And the limit is that n goes to infinity. I think you can understand it this way. Uh, but there's another factor because of this, which is minus i times minus i, that's minus 1. So minus e n by 2 times infinity. 
and now you can see what I have bought myself by doing this trick. So this is this factor and I am taking n to infinity. Okay, sorry, not taking n to infinity. I have taken t to infinity. So this is infinity. So there are many, sorry, I don't know why I said n to infinity. n is simply summed over all energy eigenstates. So you can see that this factor is going to be e to the minus e0 by 2 into infinity e to the minus e1 by 2 times infinity dot 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 where these are all the assumed energy eigenvalues of this unknown Hamilton. But you can see that in the limit all of these are very negligible compared with e0. Okay, All of these are because by assumption e1, e2, e3 are all higher energies than e0. So taking the limit of t going to infinity keeps this one and kills all those terms. Okay, can you see that? Not only it kills them, but it kills them exponentially. Because what is the ratio of this term to this term? It's e to the minus e1 minus e0 times infinity. So it's uh, very highly suppressed. Okay, whenever we evaluate an expression, we don't drop the leading term but we can drop all the highly suppressed terms compared with the leading term. That's what we're doing. Okay. As a result of it, the entire sum over energy eigenstates, n, reduces to just the value n equals 0. So this is 0 and this is 0. And so I get e to the minus i e 0 by 2 times infinity minus i epsilon and here I have omega uh, now I have n equals 0 and that's exactly what I mean by omega okay because omega is the vacuum n equals 0 in all the among all the energy eigenstates n the one where n is 0 is precisely the vacuum okay and so this is actually omega in omega in acting on pi i minus t by 2 and this is approximate but it gets very good in the limit when t is very large okay so we started with this and we brought it to that and what you can see is that this is a number this is a number but this is the state and it's the, exactly the state i was after so what I have done is projected the field eigenstate into the vacuum state. You might have seen this before. I think we have discussed this process before. And you might remember that in imaginary time, this works even better. In imaginary time, I don't even need to introduce this minus i epsilon because all these things will be e to the minus ht. As soon as I take t to infinity, the most leading term will be when h has its minimum value, which is e0. Sir. Yes. Sir, over there should be e to the power minus n by 2 times infinity times epsilon. Yeah. Where? Here? Yeah. yeah. So the next step. Uh, uh, here? No, no, second number. Where do you explain? Uh, here? Yeah, yeah. There should be an epsilon multiplier. Ah, yeah. sorry. Yes, infinity factors. Exactly. And in fact, that's the, you know, there's always some cheating going on here. Basically, the idea is that we are going to take epsilon to zero after we take t to infinity. Otherwise, we won't have gained anything from this exercise. That's right. Thank you. Okay. So now this state, therefore, we are just going to write as omega in and whatever is in front, we are just going to call it n i, where n i, some of my chalks seem to keep, there are many different types of chalks here, so let me soft ones after. So, 
that state on top is this where uh, n i is equal to everything here e to the minus e zero by two infinity minus i epsilon as well as some overlap of omega and phi. Now we really don't know what this is. Fortunately, we don't have to care. What we have done is to get a complicated sum to be proportional to a single state omega in the, which is the state of interest times some factor which is going to turn out as a normalization factor in the path integral and which will drop out like all other normalization factors drop out when we normalize the path integral suitably. So we will keep n but you will see that it will drop out soon. So we do not have to know it, it is just something. So the one line summary of this is for large time defined suitably the position eigenstate becomes proportional to the invariant. And of course, you can do this for large times in the other direction for the out state. And so, uh, putting everything together, you will find, so the other way is very easy to write. I can just write it here, uh, just by making small changes here. by f plus t by 2 e to the minus i h t by 2 <coughs> by exactly the same sort of calculation this is going to go to uh, n f uh, so omega out times another normalization factor nf. So therefore, putting everything together, we have that omega out omega in is equal to uh, limit t goes to infinity. Now I will not keep writing 1 minus i epsilon, it is understood. Uh, then uh, 1 over n i n f times phi f of x and t by 2 e to the minus i h t phi i of x and minus t by 2 and this is a quantity we know how to calculate in path integrals. It is exactly what we discussed about two lectures back or maybe in the very last lecture. Hmm? This one is a path integral and therefore this one is up to some factor also a path integral. Sir, yes. Sir, what it is saying is that uh, uh, at a very earlier time t tends to minus infinity with any state was actually in vacuum. So, yes. So I can also generalize it to the 1D quantum mechanics that we did. Yes. Is it? The, yes, you can actually and it is used there. Uh -huh. mm? And the way it is used there is to extract the ground state energy of a quantum mechanical system. Uh -huh. mm? We can actually extract the ground state energy by doing this. In that case, uh, you can actually do more because quantum mechanics is simpler. Uh, but here, up to we get this state, this, this statement up to this unknown factor. But if I take the state to be eigenstate, then uh, at t tends to minus infinity. Yeah. Infinity. See what will happen if it's an eigenstate? Mm. Then the leading, you see, the whole uh, assumption here is that the vacuum omega that we are looking for has got some component of all the states. It can be that you take a very special state instead of this omega in. If you try to play this game with a excited state of energy, then of course it has no component, it is orthogonal to the ground state, so then you will not get this result. So the, this is actually the beautiful thing that there is an assumption, but the assumption is that the vacuum is a admixture of all energy eigenstates 
without any of them, uh, where all of them contribute some finite amount. So if all of them contribute, then the leading contribution will come from the vacuum state. Actually, I mentioned this in my notes. Uh, sometimes if you want to know the first excited state, you can actually take some generic state, subtract the vacuum part of it, and then do this limiting procedure and you will get the energy of the first excited state. So that is how it works. So here it is a very, it is an assumption of being generic. Good. Okay. And now it is simply one more step. The right side we can just transport to something we already know, namely the path integral. And we simply have omega out, omega in is equal to uh, 1 over n i n f path integral d phi e to the i s of phi. Phi is the term I am using, it can be a fermion or boson or anything really, but uh, just using generic phi for any field. And the important thing is here, the boundary conditions, remember this measure requires some boundary conditions and so it is that phi at x and minus infinity is phi uh, is uh, phi i. Well, sorry, max x and minus t by 2, this is all at finite uh, t, then we take the limit later when we are calculating. So, it is phi i, the initial configuration, which is given, and at plus t by 2, the same thing is phi f. And then by definition, this overlap is that path into you this you know because after all the steps for going from here to that are just introducing uh, infinitely many time in small time steps in this thing and that's how we generate the sum over paths good okay now <clears throat> this is good but we want something this was a uh, as i said a preparation for something more complicated which is what we want and why we want it is something that you are actually supposed to know from QFT1 because the whole course was based on it. What you are supposed to be interested in is the vacuum to vacuum uh, matrix element of the time ordered product of operators phi of x and t1, phi of x1 and t1, phi of x2 and t2 dot 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 phi n phi of well uh, you can yeah they, these can all be different fields or they could all be the same field that's really not essential so what we want to insert in between omega in and omega out is a time ordered product of operators hmm? again i hope you are keeping it clear in your mind I am trying to derive path integral representations in which there won't be any operators, but they are representations of what? Of some process in quantum theory which does involve operators. That is how we get a path integral formalism and after we have got the formalism, then we forget about the operators completely. Actually we can't forget about them completely, but we do our manipulations without operators. So whenever you see an operator. This is a quantity that we are already supposed to be interested in because ordinary QFT without path integral tells us that this is what we want. Why is it what we want? From here, there is a standard procedure to get the S matrix and from there, there is a standard procedure to get the cross section and these cross sections are directly measurable. Hmm? For example, this n, this small n is 4, there are 4 particles, let us say all 4 are electrons, this is QED theory, I am trying to calculate the scattering of electron, electron going to electron, electron. 
This I can do in an accelerator. I can measure the scattering cross section. I can in particular measure its angle dependence. If I have a back to back beam, something comes out, I can measure the rate at which it comes out as a function of the angle, scattering angle. And that's something which as you, I hope you know in QFT from QFT1 is something you can calculate and compare with the experiment. And our goal is to rephrase this calculation in path integral language. If we do that successfully, then we can as well calculate it in path integral language. Okay, is the point clear? Any questions about this? Did you actually go through these steps in QFT1? Some people are saying yes, some are saying no. That's not a good sign. For some process. Huh? For some process. For some process, yeah. Obviously, you can't do every process in QFT1. But as long as you understand this connection, because uh, the reason I can't go into the reason now why the time has to be ordered and all that. That's all part of the operator formalism of QFT. Hmm? You may already uh, guess something funny, which actually it, when I first learnt it, it really shocked me. Once we get to path integrals, these things won't be operators. Therefore, we can't order, time order them. There's nothing like time ordering numbers. Numbers are just numbers. There's no nothing like ordering. But path integral is so clever that it takes care of that. And we'll see how. Okay. Now, in fact, one nice thing is, after we get this behind us, uh, it will actually turn out that path integral is the easier way of deriving the perturbative amplitudes and the S matrix compared with the operator method. It's the easier way after you have done all the formalism that we have already done. Hmm? So unlike quantum mechanics where it gave us some unnecessarily difficult ways of understanding harmonic oscillator and all that, here it actually gives us simpler ways of calculating things but still things which we already know. Later, we'll come to things that we don't already know. So we'll go, we'll go in steps for that. Okay, good. Now, how are we going to convert this into a path integral? Well, we know that it's going to be something like that because in the special case when n is zero, we already have the answer. So we have to figure out the answer when n is not zero. And for this, We'll first take these operators. As you can see, the operators uh, depend on time explicitly. And operators which depend on time are said to be in the Heisenberg picture. And by a unitary transformation, they can be mapped into operators that don't depend on time by just multiplying on the left with this and putting phi of x and on the right with e to the minus h t. Now the t is the t argument that I have on this side. And in this case, this is the same operator but in the Schrodinger picture. So the first step in converting this to a path integral is to replace every one of the operators by this kind of transformation uh, and put them in the Schrodinger picture. Now, actually, you, more or less, if you have really seen how path integral works, the rest of the story you can fill in yourself. Once we have done that, we are going to insert uh, complete, you are going to insert small time intervals which start from minus infinity up to Tn, then some more here, then some more here, some more here. And something special will happen when the time is exactly t1, t2, or tn because of these phases that we are going to introduce. And as far as if we take care of that, we'll get our answer. So let's do it. Okay. So with this transformation, the quantity of interest to us, uh, which is this or that, uh, becomes... Um, limit t goes to infinity phi f and t by 2. Okay. Now, here, <coughs> if you remember, we had minus h i h hat t and then we had phi i, but now we are going to insert all these operators, right? So, uh, let's first fix an ordering so that we can do something concretely. 
So I'm going to actually choose an ordering. Uh, just for the calculation and then we'll see. So I'm going to choose T1 less than T. So actually this may not have been the best choice because uh, that means in the un inside this T symbol, this will come last, then this, then that and so on. Okay, I hope it's okay, you can adjust. So we are now calculating this thing without the T symbol because the time ordering is chosen and here is phi of x1 t1 then x2 t2 x3 t3 etc okay so the last one is phi n at xn tn and between tn and capital t by 2 there is an amount of time t by 2 minus tn so i'll put a phase for that here and where did i get minus tn from this thing because i have converted all these operators to schrodinger picture so here was phi n and it got a phase e to the i h t n on the left. That's this e to the minus i h minus t n that is e to the plus i h t n. So I've absorbed the phase here. Okay. Then I put my operator in the Schrodinger picture phi x n. Then what phase will I have here? I'll have e to the minus i h t n from this operator and e to the plus i h t n minus 1 from the next operator. So e to the minus i h t n minus t n minus 1. Okay. Then I will put the next phi and then I have it is very obvious what the pattern is e to the minus i h t n minus 1 minus t n minus 2 etc and at the last stage I will get e to the minus i h t 1 from the last operator uh, and then e to the plus i h t by 2 and finally my incoming state phi i minus t so it's a long expression I've written, but I hope you understood. All I've done is to take that and move everybody to the Heisen, uh, to the Schrodinger picture. Probably it will simplify your lives, and I'll try to do this also in my notes. If I started with t of phi n, It doesn't matter what I start with because there's a T symbol outside it. And then by choosing this ordering, then I can drop the T symbol. Hmm? If I've chosen the ordering, then there's nothing to reorder. Then I drop that T symbol and then that thing is true. Okay, are you following me so far? It is very tedious, but we are not doing anything outside what you already know, I think, very well. Hmm? Please stop me if, if I can repeat anything to make it clear. Okay, now we are going to do our famous trick of inserting many, many complete sets of states at infinitesimal time steps. And I claim that we will get the following answer. So we are going to take this unit of time t by 2 minus tn, break it up into equal sized intervals. This one also equal sized intervals, this one also all of them and this one. Okay, And at every new interval I am going to insert um, <coughs> field eigenstates. Okay, and then I have to integrate over all the values of the field at the given time over all space. Do you remember how we did this? It was part of the derivation of path integral. The only new thing is that there are some operators. Imagine these operators were all identity operator. Then of course I could assemble all these phases into the original one, e to the i h t, and then I would do what I did in my previous lecture. So the only new thing is I have to insert these states here, 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 and once I insert them, they'll be stuck on different sides of this operator. Okay. And the result 
is a path integral. I'll write it and then explain it to you. Well, first it's uh, some kind of hybrid of a path integral and an operator thing. And finally, it will be a path integral. So capital N is the number of time steps. Phi 1 of x1 and t1. It's easier for me to write it and then explain it. Oh, sorry, this is actually not time steps. This is just finite number. This n is the same as the number of fields I inserted. Okay, so what happened? Actually, this is exactly what we did for the derivation of the vacuum path integral. I mean the one without any insertion of operators. We noticed that in field theory, you can break up this interval into a large number of time steps. And at each of those time steps, we insert a, uh, I think I haven't written the whole answer, sorry, one second. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, at each of those time steps, we insert a complete set of field eigenstates. Then uh, we notice that uh, there's this famous transformation of Hamiltonian into Lagrangian. We get the action. And uh, <clears throat> then we have to integrate over the field eigenstates. So the field eigenstate at each position where I insert it, I have to integrate over all possible uh, functions d phi 1, d phi 2, etc. of space at a particular time. I think from the look expressions, I think nobody has gone over the notes of that last lecture, but you, you really should. Hmm? Okay, and then it, you get it into this form. The new obstacle is that because of these operators, I can't continue and just get the path integral. I get a path integral which has some restrictions, and let me tell you what the restrictions are. How did I get these to be functions? Well, what I did was these were operators phi hat, but they were acting on a position state uh, eigenstate. And so they pulled out the eigenvalue. And since that eigenstate is at a particular time t, they pulled out the eigenvalue phi 1 x 1 t 1 at that value. Okay, This is not a Schrodinger operator, nor it's a Heisenberg operator. It's not an operator at all. It's just the eigenvalue of that particular position eigenstate and I am doing this integral over it. Okay. Good. Now the last step is to realize that this can be, now this part is the stuff we have al already done before but with one restriction. Okay. This straightforwardly maps onto a path integral. If I could, for example, if these were not there, I could use these integrals to remove all these things and I would have my original expression. Okay, Or I could divide the thing into infinitely many time steps, put in these things and then take the limit when the number of such insertions is infinite and I would get the path integral. The new thing is that at specific finite number of points, I have a field inserted. 
So maybe I said something wrong earlier, which I'd like to correct. To get from here to here, I didn't insert a complete set of field eigenstates at every uh, small time step. I inserted it only at these n time steps, which are correspond to these times t1 to t. Hmm? So that's why I don't yet have a path integral. The next step is to now break up each of these into a large number of small time steps and go on inserting position eigenstates. And if you do that, you'll get the following answer. So the first part is unchanged. The operators, are, the functions are still there. What is new is that I get a path integral over a very specific kind of path. So I'll write it first, t5 i comma f comma 1 2 up to n e to the i s. So what is this specific kind of path which is allowed in this integral? It's a path which starts with the um, value phi i of x at the initial time. Okay, ends at the value phi f of x at the final time. Those two boundary conditions are always there in a path integral. But this path is obliged to take the value phi 1 of x at the time t1, the value phi 2 of x at the time t2 and so on up to time tn. It has fixed values at those times. And what are those values? Well, they are arbitrary and in the end they are going to be integrated over. But when we integrate over them, we'll also have the values themselves sitting here. Okay? And the beauty of this is, now I can condense everything. I have this, and I also have to integrate over the inter intermediate values. So this measure and this measure just collapse into the unrestricted measure. And so after a very long-winded effort, I get an utterly simple formula which just says, do the path integral over all paths starting at phi i ending at phi f and insert these functions and put e to the i s of phi. That's the final answer. So to summarize the steps again, and then I hope you'll work it out for yourself. There were two steps. First, we introduced the uh, Schrodinger picture operators from the original operators. Then we introduced complete set of position eigenstates next to each of these operators. Okay, and we got this. This expression is really not a path integral. It's basically an operator, product of operator matrix elements. But because we introduced complete set of states, we have these integrals over the field configuration at each of n, finitely many n time steps, along with the operators that we chose to insert, now replaced by their eigenvalues. Okay. Then we applied what we learn about path integrals to this product from here to here. Broke up every step into some large number of tiny steps. Again, kept inserting uh, complete sets of position of, of field eigenstates. And that turned us into this path integral, where the uh, final path integral was over restricted functions that take definite values at n possible times. And those are exactly the values that are integrated over by this. And if we perform this integration, it lifts the restriction on the paths. So you get an unrestricted path integral. And you just get this. Now, if all this was too hard to follow, there's a good news. You could just say that this is the final answer. Okay. I would like you to understand the spirit of the derivation because it wasn't completely trivial. But the final answer is extremely beautiful. It says that out vacuum time out. Okay. So phi hat n x n t n phi hat 1 x 1 t 1 with a t i should put the time ordering here though in this example it doesn't matter 
it is equal to that. Of course, it's not exactly equal to that. For the following reason, there's one more step. I forgot that 1 over NINF. Right? And now you should ask the following question. When I defined omega in and out, did I normalize them or did I not? These states. I'll get a different, this is supposed to be a physical thing, right? So I better be sure that the normalizations are what they should be. They should be normalized, right? So the physical quantity is not this, though I spent a lot of time calculating it. The physical quantity instead on the left side is this divided by omega out, omega in. That's the actual normalized scattering amplitude. If by chance I had normalized the omegas, then this division wouldn't matter. Okay, But I should, in principle, divide by this. Okay, Actually, even if I, sorry, I take that back. Even if I had normalized them, I want to know the effect of inserting n operators in this transition amplitude relative to the effect of doing nothing. Okay, That's really what a scattering amplitude is. And on the right side, you can see that this is the same path integral divided by 1 over ni nf, which is always there, integral d phi e to the i s of phi. And now we see a wonderful thing, this ni nf dropout, I don't need them. Not only that, this measure d phi was full of all kind of ambiguities and so on, but I don't need to worry about them because whatever they are, it's the same measure upstairs and downstairs. Basically, why all this happened is that we are discussing, we are calculating a probabilistic quantity, so it always has to be normalized. When it's normalized, then the exact meaning of this measure is not important. You need the measure with phi's relative to the measure without phi's. So whatever goes in the measure itself is cancels out. And we can see that very explicitly when we do calculations. Yes? So there was an outer integral of all the field configurations from d phi 1 to d phi n. Yes. Did that, that vanish because we are integrating over? Yeah. So this integral on this measure is the same as this measure without this restriction. So think of it this way. I'll draw a picture and it might become clear. Supposing I have a path which starts here at minus phi by 2, just a symbolic path in one dimension, on two dimensional space or whatever you like, which goes like this. Okay. Now I tell you that I want to sum over all paths starting here and ending here, but they must pass through this set of points. Hmm? This is a time t1, this is a time t2, this is a time t3. The times are also arbitrary. They don't have to be equal steps. Hmm? I just tell you that sum over all paths which are restricted to pass through a particular value of x at t1, at t2, t3, t4, t5. So this is the x-axis. So this is the value x1, this is x2, x3, x4, x5. Hmm? Now, this includes paths, for example, like this. I can have a path which comes here. It can zigzag in x, but it has to end up at this point. Then it zigzags somewhere and comes back here. Then it does something and comes back here, like that. So that's a sum over constrained paths. They are not completely free, but they are constrained to pass through fixed set of points. Now I take this thing and I integrate over all these points. Now what paths am I summing over? Hmm? All paths, unconstrained. By integrating over the points which I had constrained, I've got the uh, unconstrained integral. That's exactly the step we have carried out here. So all these things are like the integration over the intermediate field uh, eigenvalues. And when I combine that with this, I get the unconstrained integral. But what I, what I must remember is that these phi's are sitting here. Otherwise, I would have never separated these from these in the first place. Hmm? The phi's are sitting there. So whenever these paths start at i and go at f, uh, <coughs> there is some. There are some phi's sitting in the integral, 
which will sort of notice whenever these paths pass through one of their points t1 up to tn that's uh, okay uh, and in fact you could have also naively just said well what can it be if this has a description in path integral it should be like this so simple but actually it's good to go through the process so there are two steps one is complete set of field eigenstates at the location of those original operators phi 1 up to phi n that means at the times t1 to tn that induces these integrals and then you do the usual path integral for all the intermediate uh, propagation between uh, any two regions where no phi is inserted so between tn minus 1 and tn there's no phi so we can just treat this as we did the normal path integral so it's two sets of jobs we are doing and then those jobs conveniently combine to give me the unconstrained path integral and finally they also uh, give me this nice benefit that by dividing out uh, by the same path integral I can get rid of normalizations. So there's uh, so it's a very very important formula that's kind of the key formula for path integral calculation of correlation functions in field theory. It doesn't have any ni and f in it and it's completely insensitive to the normalization of omega in and omega out because if I multiplied omega in by 10 it would cancel in numerator and denominator and on this side similarly it's insensitive to the precise normalization of the measure and now in the next lecture we'll discuss how to calculate this but there's one last question which is a bit uh, subtle and I should uh, flag it we chose a particular time ordering to get this formula. We chose that the times are ordered in this way. Okay, and then we were able to lift the t. But, so what is the formula if the times were ordered in some other way? Same, there is no other formula it could be. In fact, if you look at this, the left side uh, is independent of the order in which I write these phi's because of the time ordering symbol. It makes the left side completely symmetric among the times. If I interchange the spaces and times, it's symmetric. Right side has no operators, so it doesn't matter if I write it this way or I write it in any other way. It's just only one thing. Okay. So the conclusion is that the path integral automatically. gives us time ordered products time ordered expectation values and fortunately those are the ones we need now it so happens that in physics there are certain situations where people want uh, out of time order correlators for certain purposes so then actually path integral is a bit uncooperative. It says, look, I'm giving you time ordered correlators. What more you want? And you say, no, no, but I want out of time ordered correlator. Then you have to do something else. You have to do some analytic continuation process to the path integral to recover that thing which you want. And it's harder. Hmm? While in field theory, you just should drop the T symbol and put your operators in whatever order you like and field theory, operator field theory will give you the answer. Path integral naturally lands on the time ordered answer. Okay, with that I'll stop and next time we'll start using this rule. I think this is the last, uh, if you like, formal expression in this course and uh, you should go through the motivation or derivation, whatever you want to call it, but it's a very lovely identity. Yes. So, didn't we start with a particular uh, order when we removed the... Yes, the we did, yes. Then at what point did it become symmetric? Well, the answer is symmetric, right? Yeah. And the original thing, if we didn't remove the time ordering symbol, is also symmetric. But if I want a particular time order, as yeah. you say, yeah. of operators for yeah. some reason, yeah. then I can repeat the same process. So you take a different time order. So let's say phi 2 is before phi 1, t2 is before t1. So put phi 2 on the right, then phi 1, lift the time order again do the whole process you'll get this answer which is the same answer and it should be 
because uh, the left side is the t uh, by definition is the time ordered object so no, it, it, it doesn't I depend on the time order if i remove the time ordering operator yes if you remove the time ordering operator completely mm -hmm. and then you allow any time order then you can't do whatever i have done because remember we started by inserting complete set of states here 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 now if the times are not in sequential order i can't do that i'll actually have to go backward in time at some point and that's actually the key to finding the non uh, out of time ordered correlators i have to actually take care of that going forward and backward in time but if i only want to do it forward in time by inserting complete sets of states then this method works and it gives me the answer which doesn't care about the time order and this kind of this kind of procedure i won't be rederiving for fermions and so on uh, it works essentially the same way okay uh for gauge fields is a story of how to evaluate these things which we will be discussing soon any questions i'll stop